Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Ultimate Wedding Photography Summit. My name is Jared Bauman. I'm the president here at Shoot.it, and I'm joined by our marketing coordinator, Caitlin Cooper. Our next focus for the day is going to be on the subject of posing. Specifically, we are going to be joined by Roberto Valenzuela, who is, if not the posing expert, uh, one of the top posing experts. He's going to be providing a posing critique which means he's going to be going through user submitted images, photographer submitted images, actual images and critiquing those for us. Um, I'll be your host for the event. I'm going to be turning it over to Roberto in just a minute. And he's got well over an hour of critique ahead of us. Make sure to join the presentation uh, after the presentation. Excuse me. Make sure to join us live for the Q&A period with Roberto, where he's going to be taking your questions about some of the critique he provided, uh, maybe expanding on some of the things that people were confused by or needed some more clarity on. Um, use that. Uh, use the chat feature that you have in front of you to uh, chat in your questions, and we'll take those questions and be asking them not only throughout. I'll chat some of them to Roberto as he goes, but we'll be asking a lot of those questions afterwards in the live Q and A. So, um, again, before we get going, make sure you identify where that live, uh, excuse me, where the chat feature is, so we can use that for the live portion down the road. Yeah, and you know, before we we dive into Roberto's presentation, just for any of you that are new to Shoot.edit, let me take a second and tell you about us. We're the first choice post-processing partner for the Wedding Pro and everything that they shoot. We make your images look consistent based on your personal style. Fast is best and no one is faster. We provide turnaround time as fast as 48 hours. And it, along, along with us, you know, there are so many fantastic companies that we've teamed up with today to really make this possible. It's a, such a big event and we couldn't have done it on our own. And so I just wanted to take a minute and highlight a few of them before we turn it over to Roberto and hear his image critiques. Uh, so a few that we have today, we have MagMod. Their mission is to make awesome photography easy by making tools that get out of the way of being more creative. They believe photographers can better improve their craft when technology is no longer a mental barrier to feeling, seeing, and expressing. Photography comes from the heart, and they believe that every photograph is a perfect symphony where, symphony where art and technology become one. Uh, we also have Rocky Nook. A big thanks to Rocky Nook. Um, they, they started in 2006, and photography has been the primary focus of their book publishing program. Guided by the motto, by photographers for photographers. Their mission is to develop and publish books that educate and inspire photographers of all levels, from aspiring photographers to hobbyists to professionals. The books are written by photographers who have substantial amount of experience, deep technical understanding of the subject matter, and who are passionate about passing on their knowledge to other photographers. And on top of all that, we're joined by Roberto. And I'm reading through Roberto's bio, and um, it still always gets me every time I, I go through it. So Roberto Valenzuela is a wedding and fine art photographer located just up the road from us in Beverly Hills, California. Mm -hmm. He is a 70-time, I did not know it was that high, yes. a 70-time international award-winning photographer. He has a keen eye for what a strong image is composed of. He has served as a judge in several image critiques and competitions, including the ones held at WPPI, PPA, and European photography competitions. We are um, really lucky to have him on board as a, uh, as a shoot.edit advocate, uh, shoot.edit photographer, and joining us today to, uh, to, to bring a lot of uh, healthy uh, and heartfelt critique to a lot of the images that were submitted. So I'm going to turn over to Roberto, and just as a final reminder, I um, look forward to seeing you on the other side for the live Q&A. I will be sending some of those questions, as many as I can, over chat to Roberto, but, um, but definitely circle back and stay tuned for that live Q&A at the end of this. Most photos have the same posing problems and they are, gonna, are going to occur over and over again. So as you start to see these things, you're gonna start seeing patterns like, oh, I see how this is happening many times over. And then it's gonna start getting easier for you, which is what's great about it. If you make your mind think about the pose and you push yourself to think about the pose and what's right and what's wrong with it, or what could be improved, you become more like a, you become a fine-tuned machine when it comes to realizing what's wrong with a, with a pose. One of the biggest problems in posing, especially couples, is um, the interaction between the, between the bride and the groom. It's not believable. It looks like they are standing alone in their own little world, but they're somehow together, but there's no energy between them. And we'll discuss all of that stuff. Um, let's go ahead and start with this image. Uh, I don't know who submitted this, and it doesn't matter, but I do thank you for taking the time to submit the photographs. Um, this is for, anonymous. 
anonymous yep and, and i thank people for that let's keep it anonymous we don't need to know who took anything we just need to go over the photos and and learn from it so let me actually go out and remove this little window from here and then play this all right let's get going now of course i may not be able to do every image but we'll we'll do as much as we can first of all this image has a nice combination between the position of the body and her chin so by her body being pointed towards the left and her chin being pointed opposite of her collarbones. So if you look at her collarbones, if you make a line coming out of her collarbones and you see, and you make a line coming out of her nose or out of her chin, those two lines will make an X. They will make like a, like a, they will cross paths. Okay. Whenever you cross paths like that, whenever that happens, you're actually adding a um, dynamic feel to the photograph. You add, a sense of dynamics instead of instead of being so flatlined. There's a bit a bit of a, a liveliness to it, like liveness to it. So congrats on that. However, let's take a look at the color of the background. People don't realize how much the color of the background affects the pose, and if it affects the posing decisions you make. So, for example, the black background behind her gives a black contrast to her skin tone in her hand and also in her face. So if her face has a contrast with the background, you say, hey, that's really nice because you can see her face really well. But then the problem is also this, this photographer put the hand, her right hand is actually at the same level as her face. So once you put another body part, another part of the body close to the face, you, cr you create automatic competition between the face and the other part of the body. If that hand would have been lowered a little bit to her shoulder level, there would have been less emphasis on the hand and the emphasis would have stayed in, her, in, the, bride, in the bride's face. To make matters worse here, the background is black. So that gives that hand much more emphasis than it, than it should have had. Because now you see that contrast between her skin tone, which is like a khaki creamy color, and the black background. So if you close your eyes and then you open them, you, you notice the hand immediately, like right there to the left. And you notice her face, the bride's face too, but this hand is just competing right there. So that's something to keep, to keep in mind is, is the background making you compete with what you're trying to show? Are you trying to show how beautiful she is and her face and her smile? Then I would suggest looking around your frame and asking yourself, is any part of her body distracting from that goal? And in this case, that hand, it has way too much contrast with the background. And so the answer would be yes. And that's when you, you would say, I'm gonna lower my hand a little bit or remove the hand altogether. But you, this could have been solved by just moving the hand down. So anyway, hey, thank you for submitting this, go ahead. Roberto, a quick question we're getting. Um, talk maybe a little bit about how you feel or, or really what, what the attitude and approach should be with a contrasting background. There's also a patch of white in the background there, a kind of a bar of white off of her left shoulder is that bad is that good is that something you use to your advantage i always use colors in the background to to choose how for example if i'm going to post somebody who's more curvy or has a little bit more weight to them i choose a i choose a background that has, has a similar color as whatever they're wearing because that way you cannot tell where she or he begins or ends compared to the background. So it puts just, it, it leaves the emphasis on the face and not so much in the width of the body. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point too. And this is right? not a full body image. So the background for those kind of things is, it's a different approach too. You know, you have to take a different approach depending on not only the body type, but how you're framing the image. Correct. If, you, if you're photographing someone that has, that is more fit, or whatever you know let's just say it's more more fit a, a man or a woman then you can take more risks on the background color then you can have more of a contrasting color because you want to showcase that this person is fit but if you have a person that's curvier or a larger bride or a larger groom you sure you sure as heck don't want to pose them in front of a contrasting color because then you're actually putting emphasis on the width of the body so got it thank you perfect Yep. So let's, that's, what, that's what's happening here is that hand is just almost on its own because of the contrast of the background, but nicely, nicely done on creating a dynamic feel between the collarbone direction or her body direction and the fact that she turns her face on the other side and creates the dynamic feel that I was talking about with the X.
Okay, here's another one. Uh, I think this is beautiful lighting. I think the fact that the, you know, when window light comes into a dark room, it gives this bride complete importance to her. So nothing in this image is as important as the bride, which is a great move in this photographer's, um, uh, in what this photographer did. You know, he em emphasized her with the light. Now, even though that's really beautifully done, Let's talk about all the other things happening. If you close your eyes again, and then you open them, that, let, that right arm is just a solid piece of almost like a two by four piece of wood just sticking right down on her body. There's, there's no grace to the arm, no curve to the arm. Whenever there's an arm or a straight line, you're going to, make, you're going to bring attention to that straight line. Straight lines bring attention to them. In order to, to uh, not have so much attention on, on a straight line, you got to add a little bit of an angle. Now, if you want to add a more elegant angle, you got to make it a diagonal angle, like a little bit of a diagonal angle will do the job. So for example, she could have been holding her bouquet just a little bit higher, maybe a little bit closer to her waist, not all the way to her waist. By no means, you, you do not want that arm to be reaching a 90 degree angle because then it looks like she's really holding that bouquet with a with, with vengeance, you know? It's just a very graceful lift of the arm just to give it that curve. And then the, em the emphasis goes back to her face. Um, I don't know if you guys realize this, but whenever you have a straight arm and they're holding something with a straight arm, it, it looks like the arm is an arrow and it's pointing right down to her bouquet, taking a lot of attention away from her face. If you look at the image carefully, you see her face and then you're distracted by what her arm is pointing to because her arm works like an arrow because it's so straight. So in this case, this is exactly what happened. That arm is just going straight down to the flowers, distracting from the, from the face. So good job with the lighting, good job with the positioning of the bride and then just add a little bit of an angle to that and it will just take away it, it will put all the emphasis on her face and it will be really beautiful so that's little details like i said here's an interesting one um in chapter six of my book picture perfect posing i wrote about style like uh, the, the hands and the arms and i call it the uh, hand arm context and i say that whenever your hand is resting on something or holding something Whatever, if it takes a lot of effort to hold that body part away from your body, it's going to bring more emphasis to that part of the body. So for example, in this example, this, the, left, the bride's left hand is almost, it's way out there in its own little world. And it takes a lot of effort to put your arm that far from your body. The, if you think about what is the easiest thing your body can do to your arms, it's just to hang them down, which doesn't look good either. You gotta have a little bit of effort there to, to make it look more composed. But when your arm goes all the way out and it's holding into it, it's just holding on to something, it almost feels like it's an, there's an earthquake and she's holding on to balance herself. And you 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 almost need that strength. You see, there's a lot that if you make a line from her body to her arm, it actually creates a 90 degree angle. That's how high her left arm is lifted up. It creates a 90 degree angle between her body and her, and her hand. People subconsciously, of course, nobody does it consciously, but subconsciously, you put your arms at a 90 degree angle to maximize your strength if you're trying to hold on. If there's an earthquake happening and you really don't want to fall down, you would put your arms up at an exact 90 degree angle to, to, to be able to increase, maximize your strength and hold on. And when that happens, it removes the grace of the pose. So you have a beautiful bride, you know, she's wearing an amazing dress. And then you can't enjoy it because there is this boom, this strength that's kind of happening right there. So that's those tiny little things uh, make it make a big difference. Another thing that I wanted to talk about her shoulder, her left shoulder is actually closer to the camera quite like by far closer to the camera than her face. So the photographer used a lens that doesn't contract the scene enough in order to make her face and her shoulder come together in a two-dimensional plane. So because it's a two-dimensional plane, whatever's closest to the lens is going to have more visual emphasis. In this case, that left shoulder is actually more important than her face. 
by the way this was done. So one thing, one way to fix this issue is to A, remove that, that shoulder needs to be relaxed. So that left shoulder needs to be moved down a little bit. And she needs to be leaning her head needs to be her, basically her entire upper torso has to be leaning a little bit towards the camera. That looks a little weird when you're doing it live. But when you take a picture, when you take a photograph, the way the lens optics behave, it does not look weird in the photograph itself. So you do have to tell the bride, can you, can you lean towards the camera a little bit? And that will dramatically reduce the distance between the shoulder and her face. Okay, right now that shoulder really takes precedence. It's, it's a lot more visually in your face than her, than her face itself. So something to think about. Hey, Roberto, one of the questions you're moving from image to image, one of the questions that we've gotten a couple times from people is, when you're, how many poses do you go through when you're working with maybe like, you know, in the examples we've had here, we've had all brides. Are you going into it with a certain number of poses in mind that you want to shoot? Are you going into it and just saying, I have 20 minutes, I'm going to shoot as many as I can? Are you going into saying, I'm going to shoot 10 poses? Do you have an idea when you're doing the shoot ahead of time about how you go into it, or is it more in the moment? Um, you're prepared. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say you're, you're uh, I don't, by no means do you follow an assembly line style, or strategy style when it comes to posing. Um, I know how to bring the best in people because all human, all humans have the same body parts. I mean, they, they have arms, legs, torsos, and heads. So by pure physics of um, body dynamics, you, you understand what angles and what lighting and what perspectives make, bring out the best in people. So whether you're skinny or you're way overweight, this is one of those things that people always tell me in my workshops. They said, how can we post people that are larger? Like, they say, oh, I live in this part of the country. My brides are never skinny. And, and I tell people, you got to stop thinking that a larger person is a completely different strategy than a skinnier person. The, a skinny person also has, also has arms, legs, a torso, and a head. And a larger person has the same exact body parts. If you remove a body part away from the lens, you're going to put less emphasis on that. So if, if you have a person that's bigger and then you move their stomach further away from the camera, you or you by, by just making that simple move, you reduce emphasis on the stomach. But if you, make, if you tell the bride, can you please bring your stomach closer to the camera? It doesn't matter if she's skinny or big or medium. If you say, can you bring your stomach closer to the camera? You're going to put more visual emphasis on her stomach. So, and same thing with the hands. If you place the, the subject's hands by the stomach, you're going to put more emph emphasis on the stomach because the eyes follow the face first and then the hands second. So if the hands are placed by the stomach, when the person looks at the photograph, they're going to they're gonna go right to the stomach. So if I have a person that's bigger, I don't put, my, I don't put their hands by their stomach. I put their hands elsewhere. And then I choose a background that sort of blends in with whatever they're wearing, and you completely reduce the emphasis on her body width. And it, the, the strategy between a larger person and a skinnier person are 95% the same. And when I shoot a wedding, uh, when I shoot a wedding, I don't have any um, predetermined poses. I just go. And you, when, you, when you practice posing and you become an expert at it, you don't have as many pre-memorized poses, if you will. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You just kind of go with the moment and you fix issues as they are happening to make the pose beautiful. Now, do I spend the whole, the whole day posing? Of course I don't. You know, a lot of the wedding is shot candidly. But when it's time to pose, it's time to pose. And when the bride wants a couple of beautiful portraits of her, you better know what you're doing. Well, lots of great feedback so far. People are, are, are Jerry, saying, should I move on? Yeah, go ahead and move on. Yeah, we're getting a lot of great feedback here about that kind of thing. I think you're bringing up a really great point that um, that is really groundbreaking for a lot of people is that 95% of the posing is going to be the same, but you have to think through what you want. Everything that you're doing in that image needs to be thought through, and you need to know that every single action has a, has a reaction that comes with it. 
And by doing something, by moving something closer, by moving something further away, there's going to be a consequence to that. And the more you have thought it through, the more you can be in control of the consequence. That's right. And one of the things, and actually this photo coming up here is actually a great example, but during my posing workshops that I do, my, my two-day classes that I teach, um, this comes up every single time. They said, hey, Roberto, sure, we're shooting models, and models are, are perfect to pose, and they pose perfectly, and all this other stuff. But what about real people? And instead of explaining to, 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 to students uh, that come to my workshop, I, not only do I explain, but I actually show them live. You know, I, I choose people from the audience. Anyone can volunteer from the audience. I take the same picture from the model, as I, and then I use the same strategies as I did with the model with, with, with one of my students, whoever they volunteer. It doesn't matter who volunteers. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care how much you weigh. I use the same exact strategies, and it, and it becomes apparent to, to the students. It becomes like a wow moment to them it's going, wow, that's crazy. And of course, if you weigh 300 pounds, you're not going to make someone look like they weigh 85 pounds. That's, that's, that's just ridiculous. You're not going to do that. But you can, make, you can get the best version of that person. You can create the best angles that basically complement them and flatter them the most. doesn't matter what body weight you are. And that's where people need to start realizing that as long as if you understand posing, you understand body dynamics, you apply them equally to people. The only difference I would say between photographing someone a little bit larger is sometimes you do have to use a 7200 lens at 200 millimeters so you can contract as much as possible. And, and you also have to maybe raise your camera angle maybe, maybe just three, four more inches than you normally would with a regular person. That's it. That's the only difference is your lens choices are somewhat limited. If you're taking an actual portrait, not, not, not a landscape with a big like Great Wall of China or whatever, and then you have a small bread and groom. I'm talking about just, I'm talking about just um, a, a portrait of the person. You use the same strategies. So this is what I go over at the workshop. So people stop thinking that it takes a whole new set set of skill. It doesn't. Take a look at this photo right here. This photo right here, the 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 bride, the bridesmaid on the right, actually has her back slouched. And it's easy for people to slouch their back because you don't think about it. So whenever you're posing, you're so preoccupied with everything that you forget to tell them to straighten their spine. Like look at the girl on the left. The girl on the left has her back much straighter than the girl on the right, much straighter. The girl on the right, her lower back is actually flat. And that lower back, you know, it's called the lumbar. And that lumbar needs to be curved, needs to be totally curved. And I also tell people, Whenever you're taking photos like this, if you look at the bride in the middle, this photo, she's actually breathing out when the photo was taken. You can tell because her body is actually flat, it's actually deflated. So when you ask, when you tell a bride, can you breathe in, breathe in and keep your eyes connected to me, then the, the bride connects with your, with your lens or, or wherever you tell her to look, then she breathes in. When she breathes in, her entire body just becomes straighter. Go ahead and do that now. If you're sitting there in front of your computer in your pajamas with coffee watching this webinar, go ahead and sit down slouchy. Just sit down with a slouchy back. Now, straighten your back. Just make a little effort to straighten your back. Now take a deep breath in. And you'll notice your chest inflates. And you'll notice your body just becomes more, it, gets, it just tightens up. Well, guess what? When you tighten up, less rolls or whatever in the stomach come out. <laughs> So you're basically tightening up the stomach. So it's important that when you're posing, especially someone sitting down, you say, can you breathe in, breathe, take, take, take a nice deep breath and keep your eyes connected to wherever you told them and magic will happen. Magic will happen. Straighten their back and then ask them to breathe in. Okay, here's an example of what I said when you have a beautiful photograph, beautiful bride, great setting, but the interaction between the bride and groom is not quite there. And this is a great example where you break the pose. So you put them in this position. I don't know who took this picture, but if you're, if you're listening to this webinar, you did a great job with everything except one suggestion I would make for you is keep the pose, which is nicely done. I love the groom coming from behind. I love his hands on her waist. And I love the fact that you put her right hand and you try to engage her hand with his face. But it looks contrived. 
So there was just a little element missing. Um, and that element is the groom is not into it. The bride is more into it, but the groom is not. You see, her, you see how her head is leaning towards the groom? That energy, that creates a, a positive energy between the bride and the groom, like the bride wants to be with him by just putting that angle of her face towards the groom. So great job with that. Now look at the groom. First of all, he's slouching his back again. You can tell because he's got no neck. Like right now, his neck seems to be disappearing because his upper back is actually slouching. And second, his neck is not as, it should have been tipped forward. Another two inches would have made, would have, would have solved everything here. Another two inches of his forehead leaning towards the bride. That way, his energy is receptive to her energy and they both have the same energy together. In this example, one way to do that is to have them pose this way, tell them where to put their hands, tell them where to put their face, and tell them where to look. In, and then break the pose, separate them, and tell them to do it in motion. So they, they separate, and then they maybe three or four feet, and then they go back to it, and then they do the pose again. And it will, it will have a, a sense of movement and reality to the photo. Right now, this looks a, bit, a little bit too contrived. And one main issue is that the bride's eyes are beautifully posed, but the groom's eyes, he seems like he doesn't know where to look. And that's a problem. He looks like he's just like, where should I look? Should I look at, at, her, at her hair? Should I look at her forehead? Like, what am I supposed to do? And that's a photographer. The photographer here should have said, close your eyes and breathe in. Kiss her forehead and breathe in as you kiss her. Because then you shut down all their senses. And when the person sees the photo, they feel like that, that groom is really feeling the moment instead of just posing for because the photographer told them a set of instructions. So what so, happens? What happens when the groom's just not into it? Like in this case, and I don't know, I didn't take this picture. This was submitted by one of the one of the viewers here. But I, I've, you know, shot weddings where the groom isn't into it. We all have shot weddings where the groom just isn't into it. Um, and uh, what do you, are, are, because this is a posing webinar, are there ways to pose a groom that's not into it to make him look into it? Are there techniques in the pose itself? Obviously, there's, there's ways to get a groom or a bride more engaged from the way you interact with them. But from a posing standpoint, is there a way or are there techniques to make the pose, uh, to have the pose reflect them being more interested and more engaged? One thing that people sometimes forget in, in my experience going around the world teaching posing is that um, the expression of the subject, whether you should in fashion, uh, a child, a senior, or a, a wedding, the expression of your subjects are part of the pose. See, the pose is, is composed of the body and the head and, 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 and of the face. Where the eyes are looking is part of the pose where her chin is pointing, what direction her chin is pointing, is part of the pose. And expression is part of the pose. That's like what completes it. It's, it's like the cherry on top. Except without that cherry, the whole thing falls apart. So in, in a situation like this, I think what happened was a photographer said to him, put your arms, behind, put your arms on her waist and told the bride, Go ahead and put your, ha put your hand near his chin. And of course, there's issues with her hand too, but I, I, I don't want to get to that yet. I, I want to get into the main problem. The main problem here is that the interaction is not happening here. It looks contrived. And then the photographer walked far away. And you can see that the photographer used framing with the other leaves of the trees in order to give them visual emphasis, which, visual emphasis, which by the way, was awesome. Awesome thing to do. But because he was so far away, he was no longer able to communicate, I think, with them and bring that energy. So whenever I'm in a situation like this, I start to raise my voice in a, in, in a playful way. Like, squeeze your man, get into it, yeah. Like, you have to say something. Or, or like, I say something funny, like, smell her eyebrow. People are like, what? And they smell the eyebrow. I and mean, then you start laughing because the request is so ridiculous. You know, it's like, Hey, put your forehead right on her forehead, on her temple. Close your eyes. Breathe in. What does that eyebrow smell like? And they're like, what? And they start laughing, both the bride <laughs> and the groom. And bam, magic happens. Magic happens. It's like you, you feel this whole picture come alive. 
and it just took three seconds of you saying something so stupid that it makes them react because it's funny. Nobody ever said, when was the last time somebody asked you to, to, to describe what an eyebrow smells like? I mean, it's just so out there that it makes people react. And that reaction is natural, and that reaction is real. And then the beauty is that the, part, the whole pose is already done. All you need is to work on that spark. Right. You know, interaction. When I, interaction. When I teach my workshops for posing, people think they come to talk about how, how to pose the arms and the legs, and I tell them, you know what, we're going to talk about that too, but everybody, in my experience, has such an issue with that interaction and that spark that makes the pose come alive. And that's harder, to, that's harder to learn. That's why we spend so much time. And I push my students, you know, to, to not be afraid. If you're, if you're shy, you know, if you're shy, be shy, that's fine. But give me two seconds of non-shyness. And, and talk to your clients with energy. So that energy gets, tra gets translated into them. It gets transferred. And they feel it, like they're part of the moment. They need to feel something from you, not, not just follow directions from you. And that's why so many people have a hard time getting people to hire them. And it's because when clients go to their studios to, 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 to see if, if they want to hire you or not, and there's 10,000 other photographers in your, in your city, you're in your market, and and the bride just doesn't feel the energy, doesn't feel the spark. She may not know why she loves the photo or she hates it. She may not know why she doesn't feel anything. But if you don't appeal to her emotion, if you don't appeal to something more than just her eyes, like, oh, the post looks nice, but there's no spark, that spark is what ignites an emotional reaction between her. She wants to be that person in her wedding day. She wants to have that beautiful expression when she gets married. And if your photos don't have that, the bride may not specifically be able to put her finger on it, but she'll just won't hire you. And guess what? That will start to come to, at a price because if you book 30 weddings at a good price, you're going to do, you're going to have a good year. But if you have to keep lowering your price and lowering your price, because that's the only way you can get people to hire you, that's a dangerous path. And I, I encourage people to spend more time working on their, on their posing, an expression and creating an energy between the couple and you. There's supposed to be some there's supposed to be an energy that you as a photographer pass on to them. And that sometimes means yelling a little bit, raising your voice with excitement. They have to feel that energy. And sometimes it means saying something silly like, can you please tell me what that eyebrow what does that eyebrow smell like? You know, something funny like that. That's my that's something I come up with. You can come up with your own thing. I'm not saying copy what I'm saying. I'm saying come up with something that makes them react. And I'll tell you one thing. When you say something like, think about the first moment you first fell in love with her. That is confusing. People don't want to go back to that. They don't want to think. They just want to react. Don't say, think about your unborn children. No, don't think about your unborn children. Don't think about the first moment you fell in love. Nobody knows what that was like. No, it, it, it doesn't make them react. Re remember, reaction is part of the post. So, Roberto, I got I to gotta hand it to you. We actually, uh, the photographer of this image is, uh, is watching here and, and sent Caitlin a private message. And it said, wow, he nailed it. That's my photo. The bride has modeled before. The groom was not into it at all. <laughs> funny. You know, it, it happens, and a lot of grooms are not into it. So if, if you're watching the, if you're, if you're, I'm, I'm going to speak to the, to the author of this photograph, uh, beautiful job framing, and you are in the same position that I am in in every wedding, and every photographer listening to this is in, is in every wedding. Um, the, the groom sometimes is not into it, and sometimes the bride is not into it, and the groom is. I mean, it, 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 rarely do we have couples that are perfect and that are going to be just a, you know, a, a ball to work with. Okay, sometimes you have to have a challenge like this, and and I and I tell you, even though when grooms are not into it, they're still human beings, and they still will react if you say something, if you if you make them react to something you say, and they will still react if they feel energy from you. So if you're telling the groom, man, what are you doing, sleeping? I mean, you, do you want me to show you how to pose with a beautiful bride like yours? You want me to go over there and teach? I mean, when you say something like that, I will laugh. You know, it's like. 
because it's funny. And then you, you tell him, you know, I, like lean into her, squeeze her, man, have a good time, yeah. You know. And then people are like, all right, and then they feel it. So, and then they will appreciate the fact that you, you push them. And then they're going to say, geez, this guy's worth the money because he's pushing me, you know. He's, he's, he's making me react like the way I would react. That's why posing is not fake. You, everybody has feelings and they react in their own way to different stimuli. But you have to have stimuli to react to. So the photographer just sits in the back and just starts spitting out a couple of instructions like, hey, put your forehead here and, and that's nice, that looks good, and there's no energy from you. It's over. And then you cannot say, my clients were not working with me. My clients were not helping me out. They were too serious. It's, it is really the photographer's job to bring out their personality, their unique personality. But there has to be stimuli. And you as a photographer provide that stimuli. Let's move on. Roberto, There's another can one. You, can I ask you yeah, a quick question that we're getting? Yeah. I think it's a good one. You can spend a lot of time on it or you can just touch on it briefly. How do you balance what is obviously pretty typically a hurried pace at a wedding? How do you balance that with getting the posing just right, with making sure that all these details we're talking about are intended to? Uh, who I, I don't know who. That's a great question. Um, that came in from Caitlin sent that to me. So that came in from one of our one of our viewers here. Okay, that that's a really that's a really good one. And, and the reason why it's good is because the, the answer to that is everybody has time problems. Okay, whether you live in Australia or Africa or United States or Germany, we all have the same problems. We never have enough time to do what we want. Okay, that's the problem universally. Whether you're shooting weddings or portraits, the same problem all the time, especially with weddings. And uh, usually photographers either, whenever they get nervous, which we all do, including me. Uh, by the way, I get nervous at every wedding I shoot. Uh, I still do. Uh, I'm thankful that my posing has gotten to a point where I, I feel confident in my skill set. But nevertheless, I still want to do a great job for my clients, and I still get a little nervous. Now, um, when you're posing people, you have two choices that people usually have. The first choice is I can try to copy photos that are in my head, you know, copy photos that I've done before, copy the pose, because it's, it's like my go-to. Whenever I get nervous, it's my go-to, like hold hands, kiss. Kiss is always the, the most used one. You know, hold hands, kiss, walk, those kinds of things. And usually you put people in different places, like in, in, front, of a, in front of a tree, and you say, hey, kiss, you know, can you guys kiss? And there's nothing wrong with kissing, but it's just, it's just a, a very much a go-to kind of pose, kind of thing to do. The other option is to, is to go into a little bit of the unknown and try to create a pose by, by fixing and, and guessing. So you, you say something like this. Oh, can you put your hand, can you put your hand on his face? Uh, let's see, can you put, maybe turn your face towards him? Uh, let's see, can you, um, can you turn around maybe and maybe look at his eyes or something? Uh, yeah, that's not working. Can you turn around and actually look at his lips? Maybe that would work better. You know what? Forget that. You know, can you not just, oh, just go back to the way we started at the beginning. I mean, so that's the second option that, that people usually do. And so you kill a lot of time. You know, that doesn't work. And that's why people get away from posing and, they, they, and then they say, instead of working on the pose, they prefer to just go to the, to the other side or, you know, and say, oh, I, I, I'm a pure photojournalist. Yeah, I, I don't like posing because it's not real. So I just prefer to shoot in a photojournalistic way. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a dangerous path because, you know, if you're here to make money, there's going to be some parts of the wedding that need to be posed and the bride still wants to look good. And you still need to do that. And you still need to bring that skill. And if you say you're a photojournalist and you don't post because it's not real, then I encourage those people to do one thing master posing become very good at it become an, become great at posing and then if you don't if you choose not to use that skill then it's your prerogative you don't have to use that skill but if you go to a wedding and the bride actually says hey i would like a, few, a couple of portraits that i want you know no one's going to want portraits where they look bad and posing skill allows you to be able to handle the, 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 the human body in a way that makes them look their best and everybody will be appreciative if they look better then they look worse. Yeah, so, know the rules. Know the rules before you break them. 
you know, know, know how to the do rules. It decide not or, to. Well, yeah, not really rules, but have a skill, and then you can decide if you want to use it or not. And if a bride says to you, look, I know we talked about I only wanted to do PJ and all this stuff, but you know what? I, I do want a couple of portraits. You know, then you can bring that skill and turn it on. But it's important to, to, not, to not run away from something that's a little bit difficult. And yes, learning posing is a little bit difficult. And who cares? It should be. You know, photography is not that easy. You're dealing with psychology. You're dealing with people. You're dealing with people who've never, never posed before. You're dealing with people when they're nervous, they're at their wedding. You're dealing with a, a lot of environment. And, and it's just tough. So that's why I analyze my own photos, uh, Jared, and everyone listening. I analyze my own photos after every wedding. You know, I, I spend my time doing that. I, and I know this sounds crazy, but it, it goes back to the, 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 how much time you spend in front of the computer, you know? I mean, are you just editing your photos? Because if you're editing your photos, it's just tough for you to have time to increase your skill or to take the time to, to, to make, you want posing to become something that you, you become, it becomes second nature to you. you. You become an expert and that takes a little bit of time. So sunset photo, um, first of all, whoever took this picture, gosh, I wish I could have been there. What a beautiful time. What a beautiful light. What a beautiful setting. Like it's, it's just really nice. Um, so here's some interesting concepts. Uh, the bride and the groom are actually holding hands and they're actually connecting in that way, which is really great. The problem is um, that it, 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 the, 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 the groom has no, again, it's an interaction problem. There is no movement. I feel like in this photo, the location basically is screaming for movement and something that just looks like they were just having a walk and taking it and they were laughing or they were just having a moment, but standing there staring into nothing. I don't know if that brings out the best in this. So when you have photos like this and you don't know what to do, tell them to twist, walk a little towards each walk. And then one thing that I do is I separate the distance between so if they're holding hands and they're walking a little bit, I, I have them separate a little bit and then I have them come back together. So th they never let go of the hands. They're holding hands the whole time, but they separate and then they come back together, kind of like a small dance. And then when they do, sometimes because of the energy that I'm talking, like, you know, sometimes I'm screaming or something or I'm saying something to kind of get them to react. Sometimes they look at each other and they laugh. And if they're not looking at each other or, or they don't look, I tell the bride, look at the floor. And then I tell the groom, look at her eyes, looking at the floor. And then I say something funny, like, take a look at your beautiful wife, how she's looking at the floor. And then it, it's so weird to say that the groom starts laughing, you know, the bride starts to laugh because she, her husband's looking at her, looking at the floor. It creates a sense of candidness, like a real beautiful moment happening. So here in this image, um, that's missing. Another thing that's missing is that the two arms, the groom's right hand, the groom's right hand, an arm and the bride's left hand are just not doing anything at all. Now I see the bride that had, is, is about, is almost touching her dress. Um, I, I think it's what I said again, it's a straight arm. You don't, you wanna avoid having the straight arms going down. Remember you wanna add here, if you're taking notes, write this one down. Think about diagonal lines in every, in every part of the body that you try to even create. The more diagonal lines you create, the better. Okay, write that down. Diagonal lines. If that arm was, if the elbow was bent a little bit, maybe she was picking up her dress, so she's not stepping on the grass. That picking up her dress action is going to create a diagonal line between her and her arm. And that's, that's all you need. Is you, give, you have to give those arms an excuse to be where they are instead of just having them hanging down. By having them hanging, it tells the viewer of the photograph that there is a lack of interest. So you have to remember that the body language is very important and your arms hanging down, it means you have no interest at all. So get the arms engaged. Um, don't try to avoid having these diagonal lines. Uh, try to avoid having straight arms and try to say to myself, try to say to yourself, could I add a diagonal line with her left hand? Her left hand doesn't have to be doing anything special. She just has to be maybe lifting up her dress three inches, and that will create that nice curve of the elbow. So I, lo I love that line, give the arms an excuse. 
to be there and to be doing what they're doing. You know, if they don't have a reason to, you have to have a reason for every single arm and every single body part and everything. Uh, question for you. Uh, yeah. So I'm looking at this image and I, I love, so the question really, it centers on what do you do when you're trying to balance awesome lighting and posing up against some, uh, up against the, uh, the reaction or the way that it would come across and appear. I love the light across her face. You know what I mean? I love that. And, and obviously, um, she has her eyes closed, and that's distracting, as you talked about. But I love the light and the, the light and the way it plays across her face and creates that line. How do you balance? How do you deal with? Are there strategies to take on those sort of situations where you're balancing posing and lighting, and you're balancing the emotion and the reaction versus the, the way that the angle looks and the way that the, uh, the body parts are placed? Sometimes, actually, many times when you have lighting that is that is like this very directional lighting like this uh you have to make choices for example um usually when the lighting is that beautiful or that intense and it's very highly directional like it is in this case like this clearly the sun is clearly very down coming down from the left of the image coming into the right that's a highly 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 directional light whenever i have directional light that's that apparent here's another good one to take notes on if you are writing notes I choose to feature one instead of both people. So you, I, I try to use the light and I just shower the bride or the groom by themselves with that beautiful light. I don't, in this photo, for example, the bride by herself in this image would have been a gold mine because of the beautiful rim light. How it's, that light from the sun on the left is just caressing her face in the most glorious way. But then the groom, is actually being backlit and his face is in total shadow. His face is, it, 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 when it comes to lighting, his face has no life, it's dead. But she comes alive. So in this case, I would have just removed the groom completely and, and, and let the brine shine here. So that would have been the solution for something like that. You can always shoot bride and groom together later or whatever, but when you have light like this, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to separate the light in between two people. I want to just go all the way and give it all to the bride. Or you could give it all to the groom. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's just Yeah, a this, this light is just beautiful. Uh, whoever took this image, I mean, what, what a magical moment. This light is beautiful, and I love the image. Um, it's also cool that the, the photographer here, the pose that he did with the bride, how he turned his face to the light, is what makes this so great, you know? Uh, I, I wish the groom was in there. The groom doesn't seem to be doing anything, doesn't seem to be complimenting this image whatsoever. I, imagine, put your hand, if you guys are watching this, put your hand on your screen over the groom. Just cover the groom for a bit. And then you'll see the landscape with a bride by herself. How about that? Like, what, 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 look at that beautiful image. And I think, looks like, you know. Looks like Vera 125 took credit for this, whoever that is. But, uh, look, yeah. there's a fairy tale here. It's just gorgeous. And, and this is another thing I go over in my workshops that people wouldn't normally think is that posing, a lot of it, a lot of the posing has to be adjusted to the light. So wherever the light is, I actually adjust my pose accordingly. So you don't just come up with poses and you use the same poses or, or you use the same strategies um, universally. No, you don't do that. It, it, it is a balance between the light and the pose. So sometimes the light dictates the pose and sometimes i want the pose to be the pose and then i have to create the light in order to fit the pose i want in this case the light dictates the pose and the photographer here did a great job with the bride because he's turning to the right and it's just getting showered and it makes people go wow what a beautiful image if the groom wasn't there would have really helped out this image so let's move on to the next one here awesome Okay, here's a fun one um, to discuss. I'm going to go a little bit more into smaller details about the pose here. Okay, things that you wouldn't normally think about. The first one is, in my book, I wrote a chapter called The Origin of Hands and Fingers. I wrote that chapter for reasons like this. Look at the bride's right hand. It comes out of nowhere. And you do not see any part of her arm that will say this arm belongs, belongs to this hand. It is possible that someone is hiding behind the groom, behind that beautiful, amazing rock wall or whatever that is. 
it is possible that somebody could be hiding there and just putting their arm up there into the groom's shoulder because there is no origin of the wrist or, or a piece of the hand. All you need is a little piece of the hand. So the way to fix this is to have brought her closer into him and actually grabbed her fingers and put them on his head with her fingers pointing to the, to the sky. It's like, she's correct, it's like she's bringing his head gently into her. So her fingers should have been relaxed gone and being pointed up so it's touching the back of his head in a very gentle very delicate way and it's and it's just bringing him into her instead of the hand just coming out of nowhere and then you don't see the wrist and you don't see the uh, a piece of the arm that should be attached to that hand and then look at his left hand his left hand coming out of her waist is coming out of nowhere all you see is fingers coming out of the rocks that's weird so in this case, I would have told the guy, the group, to just go ahead and move his hand a little bit into her body so her body blocks the hand. Obviously, the groom cannot show his weight, his arm here because, you know, he wouldn't be able to wrap his hand enough, right? So the solution here is to actually bring the hand back and hide it, okay? Um, and another one is the hand contact system, again, in Chapter 6 of my book. His hand, his right hand, is not doing anything that's contributing to the beautiful moment that's happening here. Like you can tell that she's into him, like her arms are wrapped around and all this stuff, but then his hand is just sitting there touching his own leg. Why is his leg, his hand there? He, he should be on her, on, on, on her. So you got to think about what the hands are doing. Like it, he, I think that hand could, would have been just beautiful on, on her leg. I mean, it was like, it's four inches away and, it, and his, the girl's leg is four inches away and he's just not taking advantage. Now let's talk about the left leg of the bride. The left leg of the bride here should have been relaxed. It's not. Uh, her weight should have been put more on her right leg and less on her left leg. That way her left leg can bend towards the groom and it will create a beautiful curvature of her thigh, will show through the dress. Here's a bride that's fit. So if she's fit, grab her left leg or the leg closest to the camera and bend it create a diagonal line that's very clearly visible on, on the on with a dress that's basically fitting and it cre and you, you'll be able to see the shape of her leg through the dress and that and then you put the groom's hand on that leg bringing even more emphasis emphasis to her curves making this photo just 10 times more beautiful okay oh another one is Another one I want to talk to you guys about here is think about what is the contribution of the of the flowers here. She's got her she's holding her flowers. It's almost getting in the way between them. It's almost like an obstacle. I gotta encourage people if you're if you're listening to this, 97, 98, 99, whatever percentage above 90 should not have the bouquet on the on the on the posing of the bride and groom pictures together. Okay. Maybe you can use the bouquet for a traditional bride and groom pose where the bride wants to see the flowers and she wants to show you her dress and her flowers that she worked hard. But in a situation like this where you're trying to create a scene or a mood, why is she holding the flowers? It, it, it gets in the way of her hands being able to be engaged with the groom. So if you can, just put the flowers away and give it a try. And, and then when the bride, if the bride says, I would like to have a photo with my flowers, then take a traditional portrait with the flowers. But when, when it's a moment like this, you don't need the bouquet. All right. Um, in the positive sides, great job with the back. the back. The guy's back and the bride's back are actually straight. Um, one thing to remember is that the bride's right shoulder is very much blending into the groom's face. And I think you should change the angle there. So grab that, the bride's right shoulder needs to be turned more clockwise. That way, the shoulder doesn't blend in with the face. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, Jerry, does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. I think, that, I think that the most important thing is, is that what you're calling out is the distinction because it just blends together, especially when it's kind of far away. I mean, we've got a couple of comments here on the webinar about Hey, can you guys zoom in on this image? All that sort of thing. And 
and obviously there's some presenting issues with we can't really do that just from a presentation standpoint. But one of the things that I always thought was, well, no, we can't zoom in on the image because that's not the image. The image is from a distance and the image was taken in this manner. And in order to critique the posing of this image, things like the face getting lost in the shoulder, when you're far away from the image, when it's a wider image like this, you have to pay really close attention to those details because the further away the image is, the more important the pose becomes to create that distinction and set the bride and groom apart from their background, their setting. Exactly. And these are the little, remember when I said at the beginning of the webinar that sometimes the difference, the difference between a great pose or a great photograph and, and, and just a nice one is, a, is tiny little minuscule little changes in the pose, okay? It, this is one example of that. That shoulder, her, the bride's right shoulder is way too high, first of all, it's not relaxed. It needs to be dropped down and her whole body or that right shoulder needs to be turned clockwise. It needs to be, it needs to be going um, more towards the wall in order to, to reveal the wall as a background to the groom's face. Right now, the, the, the groom's face, the background is, is a piece of skin. It's the bride's shoulder. So one thing I encourage you to do is if you do listen to what I'm saying and you, you do take the time to analyze images, after each wedding you do, you're going to start picking up on these things more and more and more and more. And, 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 and when you are shooting, because you're going through this process during the week, when you actually find yourself shooting, your, your brain will not disappoint you. Your eye will be able to recognize that shoulder in the back and be like, hey, can you please relax your right shoulder and, and, and bring it back so it doesn't blend in? You know, things like this. Um, Either way, nice job. And I, I may be able to show some of my images and be able to show what, how I, I adjust my own things. In fact, maybe I should do that. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I know we talked yesterday about you bringing up a few of your own images because I, you were bringing up a few of the images yesterday. We were just talking off the record, but the insights you're able to bring from your own images and the critiquing process you go through in your own images, I think it's fascinating. It's certainly further than I ever went when I was shooting weddings, um, you know, full time. Uh, right. I kind of would get lost, you know, when I was a full time, I still, sh I still shoot a few weddings a year, but when I was shooting full time, I just got bogged down in the details of executing every week and didn't really bother reviewing my images for posing. Uh, I thought it was fascinating listening to you talk about it yesterday when you and I were talking about it. So I think it's great bring up a couple of your images and talk about the critiquing you go through on your images. Um, and uh, you were pretty candid and transparent about that. Yeah, I mean, you're going to do it. And actually, I want to bring up a point. Um, can, you guys, is this, can you guys see that image right there, Jerry? Do you see the image I just put up? It's perfect. Yeah, it looks great. looks great. Okay. Here's an example of, um, here, this is, this is a, I, I asked the groom, you know, the, the father, you know, to, to hug the, the groom, you know, they, they do that. But here's an example of where I wanted the light to feature the father. So I pointed the father towards the window. And the father was kind of like, you know, he's a guy, you know, he's like, oh, I, you know, they, they don't give you any expression. And this guy's Egyptian. He doesn't even speak English. And I still got a reaction out of him because of my energy of my voice. And the fact that I, when I decided to do this, to do this picture, I look at the window light. And when the window light is directional coming like this, obviously every, every light is, every window light is directional because it's coming from the window. I told the groom, turn this way, have your dad hug you this way so the, so the light features the, the father. And look what a beautiful image that is. It was that simple. It is those tiny little stupid little details that make a difference. When I showed that photo to the groom, the groom was just almost, he couldn't even handle it because you know he's close to his dad, but his dad never shows expression. And the fact that I was able to bring out expression out of him, it was what, really wonderful for him. So that's really beautiful. Um, Here's, oh, before I move on, um, take a look at constant usage of hands. Look how the hands are interacting within the pose here. Like, the, imagine the, the, the father's hand, uh, to everyone listening, imagine the father's hand, his right arm, just hanging down like a monkey, just hanging down, like not engaged. That's what happens sometimes. You gotta get that arm in there. You gotta get those arms. You gotta question what are the arms doing? Okay, look at this image. This is straight out of my camera. Not no editing yet, nothing. Look what the arms are doing. They're very gently holding the veil, which is looking out. Their hands are doing something, which is fine. 
take a look at this image. Look at, look at the way the hands are. Now, let's talk about this. This is actually kind of funny. Here's a mistake I made in this pose. And I don't care. Here's why I don't care. If you ever come to one of my, my two-day posting workshops, I repeat this a hundred times because I want this to be very important to them. And if you are writing now, down something, please write this down. Posing doesn't have to be perfect. Okay? Posing. Let me repeat. Posing does not have to be perfect. Not every part of the image or not every part of the pose has to be perfect. Okay? It's more important to create a beautiful expression, to capture a beautiful expression and a true beautiful moment that's happening, then to destroy the moment because I, I not take a picture because one of the fingers is off or one of the wrist is out or something is not quite right. Please do not do that. Please prioritize a great moment and please prioritize a great expression over anything pose related. I do it too. Here's an example of that. I made them react. And when she reacted, she reacted beautifully. Look at the groom. The groom's energy matches the bride's energy. She is laughing, having a moment with her own little personality. And he knows her and loves her little character traits. And he's smiling tenderly at her because she's reacting in that way she normally does. You can totally tell that story by looking at this image. But look at the left hand. The bride's left hand moved down when she reacted. And it's like in the middle of his face. Okay. I don't care. It is such an amazingly beautiful picture. The light is just dead on. And everything is mainly dead on. But her left hand failed. That's okay. Take the picture. Don't be so anal about the pose that you can't even enjoy a photograph like this. So remember, Learn posing as much as you can. No posing as much as you can. Take the time. It will save your business. Trust me. So are you basically saying that expression, true, genuine expression trumps perfect posing? Absolutely. You do. If you look at this pose, 80% of the pose, 90% of the pose is beautiful. It's dead on. Her back straight. His back is straight. No one's slouching. Her, look, look at her left hand, the, the, the hand with the engagement ring. Look at her left hand is very gently creating a diagonal line down, towards, down to, to, towards his arm. Do you see that? That was not by accident. I put her arm there and I, and I, I bent the wrist in that angle. Okay. And then I put her hand on his face. So her, her right hand could be, could be engaged with him. But when I walked away and I started, I started making them laugh and making them react, she moved her hand down as she reacted. And you expect that. But 90% of the pose is beautiful. Just the hand is not right. But the expression trumps it. So when you look at this image, you can't help it to, but to love it. Look at the lighting in the trees. Look at the lighting in, in them. Look at the, how the light caresses the back. So look, I wrote the, this book on posing that's like, everybody thinks of me as like this posing expert person. And, I, and if you... And I don't know if I am or not, but I do tell you this. If I am a person that's known for posing, being, being knowledgeable in this area, then remember what I'm saying coming out of the horse's mouth. It is more important to capture a great expression or a great moment than to be, than to, than to be so anal that you would destroy that to try to fix a, a simple posing issue like a finger or a hand or something small. You, you don't worry about it. You do the best you can like I did here. And if something goes wrong when they react, you accept it, you take the picture and you move on. And your clients will love you because this image, images like this sell. Okay. Um, here's a good one. Uh, just, just for fun, uh, a, a little bit of fun on the family pictures. Take a look at this family image. This is okay. good. We had, a, we had a lot of questions about the family formals, about are all these ideas you're talking about with posing do they apply on family formals arms hands all the movement we talked about uh, several people uh, chatted in and said how does this apply to the family formal how does this apply when you're setting not just the bride and groom or just the bride or just the groom but multiple people i'm glad you're bringing up an image that has more than just a bride and a groom in it and the answer to that is it's exactly the same thing that i just talked about interaction having the hands being engaged energy leaning towards the camera 
interaction between each other has to be believable, whether you're shooting one person, two people, or you're shooting four, like in, the, in my image here. Okay, there has to be some sort of energy. Now, does every photo, does every family photo have to look like this? Of course not. Look at this image. This is a traditional image I took of them. But I still have hands interacting. I still have hands up and down, left and right. They're not all just mirroring each other. I wrote a book in my, in my book called Mirroring because a lot of photographers, they, they hold the bouquet the same way. Like they have all the girls holding the bouquet the same exact way. It looks like robots just holding. It. Whenever you mirror something, it becomes less candid. It becomes contrived. So by having, even in a nice traditional photo like this, I have to have people put their hands in different places. Yes, I put their hands in different places just to be able to break that monotony, break that roboticness to it. And I look at the guy on the right and look at the girls second to the right. Look how they're kind of leaning forward. Now look at the Indian, look at the fathers, the fathers in the back and the fathers on the, on, the father on the left. They look, they're smiling. Indians, sometimes these, these families don't smile. And I got everyone smiling. The bride almost died when she saw this photo because she's like, I've never seen my, my father react like this. It's crazy. And then they go tell everybody that their photographer just was the, just the best. And they just talk about you like they're, they're, they're your disciple because you bring out the energy on them. Don't, don't be that photographer that says, oh, my clients didn't give me what I wanted. Or, oh, in, in this culture, they don't, they don't smile, they don't do this. Maybe that's the case. And you don't have to have them smiling you know, in every picture. But when it's time to, when it's time to do a, 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 picture, a nice family photo that you, you want to feel the family's warmth and how connected and how close the family are, it's nice to have a smile. And that's when you push them a little bit. Okay? But here's a traditional photo. And the, 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 uh, the, everything I've been talking about applies 100%. And then here's a more interactive photo so you can you know you can choose between the two but these are the same exact principles that i was talking about with with two people the interaction between all these four people are exactly the same here's an, a good one uh, when it comes to movement uh let me see here if i have let's see here Here's a good one. Um, it's a very simple image, but look how look at the elegance of that. Okay, I, I wanted to show this. This is not an award-winning image or anything. It's just a beautiful image that sells. Okay, and there's a difference between award-winning images and images that sell. This one sells. Look at the way her legs are. Her I split the weight of her weight distribution is split between her legs. So her weight is on her left leg, not on her right leg. And Look at the very gentle diagonal lines of her arms. Now, what's important here is that I separated the arms from her waist, and I did that by giving her the excuse to hold the veil, hold the veil ever so gently. And when I did that, it gave the hands an excuse to be separated from the body. And when I did that, I told her to hold the veil with her thumb and her middle finger. Not with, not, don't grab it. Don't make a fist when you're grabbing the veil because that, that creates strength. And anything strong takes away from anything finessed. I want this to be a finessed feminine photograph. So look at the way she's holding the veil. I did that by analyzing my own photographs. I realized that whenever I told Bryce to hold her veil, they would actually grip it like a fist. Big mistake. You know, it's important to do, to do it carefully. Now, sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes they hold the veil the wrong way. But as long as it looks like there's not a lot of tension in the hands, it works. For example, look at this image here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, let's see here. This one. Take a look at this image. She's holding the veil with the wrong fingers. Okay, even though we talked about it, she, you know, as she was walking down the stairs to create that movement that I asked, her fingers went the wrong way. And now there's a little bit of tension in her hands, not much, but the fact that the, her expression was perfect and the movement in her body is believable, I took the picture. I did not say, hey, can you go back and do it again and hold it with your thumb and middle finger? No, that would have ruined it. And something that's very important here that if you're listening to this, notice how her hands, notice how her, her right hand is higher than her left hand. That's so important 
Okay, I even wrote a whole chapter on that. It's to make sure that one hand is higher than the other. One leg is higher than the other. Like it creates a sense of candidness. It creates a sense of movement. When the two hands are mirroring each other, if, if they were both at the exact same height and the exact same level at the exact same angle, it looks contrived. It looks like, it looks like a photographer posed her. But if you look at this photo, it looks like she was just a bride coming down to get married and she was just walking down the stairs. And it looks like she didn't want to trip on her veil as she walks down the stairs because she's very much paying attention to the stairs as she's walking down. All of this was part of my instructions. Look down to avoid, you have to think that you're going to fall. You want to avoid falling. So you want to make sure that you look down at the stairs and you get that veil out of the way. And when you hold up the veil, make sure you hold it gently with your middle finger and your thumb and make sure that one hand is higher than the other. And then people are like, well, that's clear. And then they do, they do it. And it's amazing. The results are amazing. It, it takes five seconds, but here's the key. You need to know what you need. You need to know what you want. And that takes practice. All right, Roberto, we probably have time for about, about one more day here. We got to, Get into, uh, get, into, get into that time. Okay, I'll go through this one. Um, actually, just to make a funny a, a point, take a look at the bouquet, how the bouquet here gets in the way. I think you'll start to realize, remember what I said at the beginning, that you'll start to see the same issues over and over. Here's an example of that. Look at that bouquet just gets in the way. She's not interacting with him because she's holding the bouquet. Here's another one. The bouquet gets in the way. All you see is the bouquet. You don't really see her. Because the bouquet is closer to the camera, it, it, it becomes more visually, uh, more important in the bread and groom themselves. So, you know, look at this. All of these have the veil, the, the, the flowers. And, and see this one here, you can see the fingers coming out of nowhere. You can see his hands coming out of nowhere right there on, on, on her waist. Um, there is one that was kind of important here. Let me see this one. In, um, in my book, I wrote a chapter called point of contact check, okay? And the point of contact means if you were to fire your camera, what is the first body part that the camera would hit? Like if something came out of your lens, like a piece of paper or something would come out of your lens, what part of the body would hit first? And the answer here is the elbow. The el her elbow is by far the first thing that the camera sees. So you got to put that elbow down and you gotta aim the elbow towards the floor. And then you lean the, the upper body towards the camera, creating even more emphasis on the face because you're bringing the face closer to the, closer to the lens. So, you know, this is what we do. This, is, this takes practice, this takes some doing, you know, go out there and shoot and try it. And, uh, and li those little things are gonna start becoming apparent to you because you're gonna see the same mistakes over and over and over again.